Hello there, my name is Barth, and in this video I want to talk about a seemingly complex but actually fairly easy to understand concept that comes up again and again in the most fundamental of physics equations, as seen in the Schrodinger equation, wave equation, Euler-Lagrange equation, heat equation, and many more. The idea that I'm talking about is that of partial derivatives. If we understand partial derivatives, then we're well on our way to decoding what each of these equations actually means and what they're trying to tell us. Now, if you're not familiar with any form of derivative or calculus, then stick around as we'll talk about it step by step in this video from the beginning. And if you know a bit about differentiation, but aren't yet familiar with multivariable calculus or partial derivatives, then feel free to skip to this timestamp in the video. All these strange names sound complicated, but they're just mathematical terminology for concepts that are actually not too difficult to understand. As always, if you enjoyed this video and find it helpful, then please hit the like button, subscribe, and hit that bell button for more fun physics content. Let's get into it. So first things first, let's talk about exactly what we mean by the word derivative. To do this, let's imagine a scenario where we're driving a car along a road that has markings on it. This just makes it easier to measure the car's position at any given point in time. Let's say at the beginning, the car starts at a position of x is equal to zero and then moves 10 meters every second. Now, normally we measure car speeds in kilometers per hour or miles per hour but we'll go with meters per second in this video, so we stick with the SI base units, because we're proper physicists. Anyway, so we can say what the position of the car is at any given point in time. x of t is the function that tells us the position, and we can say that x of one second is equal to 10 meters, meaning that at a time of t is equal to one second, the car is at x is equal to 10. And we can do this for any other point in time that we want to study. But what about if we're talking about the speed of the car? Well, we know that an object's speed can be found by calculating its current position, minus the position it was at some time ago, divided by the time it took to get from there to where it is now. In other words, the distance covered divided by the time taken to cover that distance. This is great, but of course it only works if the car is moving at a constant speed or at the same speed all the time. So what do we do when the car is changing its velocity over time? Well, this is where our derivative comes in. The derivative dx by dt measures how quickly x, the position, is changing over the time t. For example, if the car accelerates or speeds up over time, then our value of dx by dt may look a bit like this, alpha times t squared, where alpha is just some constant value. If we want to work out the velocity of the car at any given time, we simply plug in the value of the time we're looking at. At the beginning, the car moves slowly, as shown by the small value of t squared, but then it gets faster and faster as time progresses. Anyway, the point is that dx by dt shows us how the quantity x changes with respect to the quantity t. Another way to write this is d by dt of x. In other words, we can differentiate x with respect to t or find the derivative of x with respect to t. I'll be using all of this terminology interchangeably throughout this video. It all means the same thing, which is finding out how fast x changes as t changes. And it's worth noting that all of this is just notation. The whole d by d something is just how we write derivatives. The d's are meant to represent changes in. So as we said earlier, we're measuring how x changes with a change in t. And by the way, we can differentiate this quantity again with respect to t if we want to, to find out this time how quickly the velocity changes over time. This is known as the car's acceleration. We can write this as dv by dt. And we could also write this in terms of x rather than in terms of v but we don't want to write d by dt of d by dt of x. So instead we just write d2x by dt squared. All this means is that we're looking at the second derivative of x with respect to t. And the third derivative would be d3x by dt cubed and so on. So that's a very basic overview of derivatives. If you'd like to find out a bit more detail about these, then I'll leave some resources and links in the description box below. But now let's talk about partial derivatives, where the nice normal d's become curly d's. 
To understand partial derivatives, we first need to think about quantities that are dependent on two or more variables. When we studied the position of our car, we saw that it only depended on one quantity, time. In other words, we could plug in a single value of t and find out what the position of the car was at that value of t. However, let's now consider something else entirely. Let's now think about a surface along which we can move and the height of this surface at different points. Let's say, for example, that our surface looks like this, and we can study the height h for different values of x and y. In this case, x and y are our independent variables, and the height has different values depending on which values of x and y we choose. At this x and this y, the height is small, but at this x and this y, the height is quite large. For this particular surface, we can even write an equation for h in terms of x and y. It looks something like this, x squared plus y. Feel free to pause the video here and convince yourself that this equation does indeed represent a surface like this, or at least a better drawn version of the surface. The easiest way to do this is to choose random values of x and y and compare the height that these values give with the height given for other nearby x and y values. The key thing to take away here though is that if we pick a random value of y, then study how moving along the x direction affects the height of the surface, we see that the height changes quadratically, like an x squared curve. It starts out flat, then becomes steeper and steeper and steeper. Similarly, if we chose a particular value of x and moved along the y direction at this value of x, then the height increases linearly with a constant slope or gradient. And this is the precursor to exactly the kind of information partial derivatives allow us to find. Calculating the partial derivative of h with respect to x allows us to see how the height changes as we move along the x direction for a fixed value of y. That fixed value is one we can choose, but importantly, it stays fixed once we choose it. This notation, using the curly d's rather than the straight d's, makes it clear to us that we're looking at a partial derivative rather than just a normal total derivative. Although some form of partial derivative was first seemingly calculated by Leibniz, the notation we commonly use today was first introduced by André-Marie Legendre. In this case, the partial derivative of h with respect to x is just the derivative of x squared with respect to x, because we treat y as constant, and the derivative of a constant is zero. If you're familiar with derivatives, then you'll know that the derivative of x squared is 2x. What this means is that once we pick a constant value of y to move along and move in the x direction, the gradient of the height surface changes like 2x. The gradient or slope at x is equal to zero is simply zero, meaning the surface is flat at x is equal to zero. The gradient at a higher x value is two times that x value, meaning the slope is getting steeper and steeper with every change in x as expected. Similarly, we can find the partial derivative of h with respect to y. Mathematically, this means we keep x constant, meaning x squared is also constant. The only thing we need to differentiate here is y. The derivative of y with respect to y is simply one. What this means is that once we choose our constant x value, the slope of the surface is one, regardless of what y value we're at. The slope is constant all the way along, which makes sense. The gradient does not change as we move from here to here, for example. And that is what partial derivatives represent, the rate of change of the top quantity with respect to only the bottom quantity, as we treat all other variables as constant. We could think of it as studying the isolated change in the top variable based only on the bottom variable. And this is the kind of thing that crops up a lot in physics because quite often we have quantities that depend on multiple different variables and we want to study how they are affected by individual variables independently of any other variables. Let's look at the classical wave equation as an example. This version studies how the oscillation of a wave depends on the position in space that we're studying as well as on time. In fact, this equation tells us exactly how the second partial derivatives with respect to each variable should link with each other in order to follow the laws of physics given by Maxwell's equations. Therefore, any wave whose oscillation parameter behaves in such a way that it obeys the wave equation 
is a wave that can exist in our universe, assuming the theory behind this equation is indeed a good description of our universe. As we can see, the two variables studied here are position and time. This equation can also be extended to more than one spatial dimension as well. Another example using similar physics, but a different relationship, is the heat equation. This one looks at the temperature of an object at different points in space and over time. Notice how this time we have the first derivative of the temperature with respect to time. This simply reflects the physical behavior of heat and how temperature changes occur in objects over space and time. A third, rather interesting example is the Euler-Lagrange equation. This equation deals with the derivative of a mathematical quantity known as the Lagrangian, with respect to some generalized coordinate. I've discussed the Lagrangian in more detail in this video up here, check it out. I've also linked it in the description box below if you're interested. But what I want to talk about here is the generalized coordinate Q. Depending on the specific system that we're studying, the actual physical objects that we're looking at, Q could represent a spatial direction, such as x, y, z, or another type of coordinate known as a polar coordinate, which is also discussed in this video up here, also linked in the description box below. But let's carefully look at this term here. It's our generalized coordinate with a dot on top. That's simply a short way of writing the derivative of that coordinate with respect to time. So if Q represents the position of some object in the X direction, then this term would look at how the Lagrangian changes with position. And this term would look at how it changes with velocity. That's the derivative of the coordinate itself with respect to time. Now this is a bit mind bendy and there are some interesting quirks of this equation. So I'd love to make a separate video discussing all of these. Let me know if you'd like to see that at some point in the future. And with all of that being said, I'd like to finish up here. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then please hit the thumbs up button, subscribe and hit that bell for more fun physics content. Please also check out my merch. It features a quantum dice design based on a famous quote from Albert Einstein. There's a link to my spring merch store in the description box below. And finally, I'd also like to say a huge thank you to all of my Giga patrons, as well as all the others over on my Patreon page. That's also linked in the description box below if you'd like to support me on there. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you very soon.